In this video, I plan on sharing with you an easy and simple way to explain beyond a reasonable doubt to a non-lawyer. And in a criminal case, this is so important, especially during jury selection, when you want everyone to understand the burden of proof. And so to show you all this, I plan on giving you a small snippet from one of the lessons in Trial Ad Academy. Check it out. If you like it, hit the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet, you know what to do. Now it's time to roll that intro. Now it's time to talk about beyond a reasonable doubt. And if a lawyer finds themselves trying to define beyond a reasonable doubt to a potential jury, then they're going to be in so much trouble because beyond a reasonable doubt doesn't have a clear definition that's going to make sense and connect with every potential jury member that's hearing that definition. So why is that? It's because beyond a reasonable doubt is less of a definition and more of a concept. And the best way to describe or define a concept is by way of example. Let's use an example that I think everyone can relate to, which is buying something from the grocery store. And let's be a little bit more specific. Let's say you get to the grocery store and on your list is to buy a box of Cheerios. So you go to the cereal aisle, you see the box of Cheerios, you find the right box that works for you, you throw it in your basket, you go, you check out, you pay for it, you go home. I bet you probably didn't realize this, but you're actually doing a bit of a beyond a reasonable doubt analysis. You see, you actually don't know with 100% certainty that what you just purchased actually contains Cheerios inside. And the only way for you to know what actually is inside is for you to open up the box and to look. But we don't do that. No, we see the box of Cheerios, we put it in the basket, we check out and we buy it. So the question is, Why do we do that? You see, whether you're doing this subconsciously or consciously, you're actually conducting a bit of a factual analysis every time you purchase something from the grocery store. Whenever you pick up that box of Cheerios, you look and you see the logo, you see the image of the Cheerios, you see maybe the brand on the bottom, you feel it, you look at the box, the box isn't torn up, it looks legit, it looks just like all the other Cheerio boxes that are at the store. It's like all the other Cheerio boxes that you've seen in the past feels the same as what you see at the store, feels the same as what you've felt in the past, and there's really no cause for alarm, so you throw it in your basket and then you go and purchase it later. Now, the question really is, is it possible that there's scrap metal in that box? Well, I guess it's possible. I mean, in reality, anything is really possible, but is it reasonable to assume that there's actual scrap metal in that Cheerio box? And that gets you to really defining what beyond a reasonable doubt is. So if we're being hyper-technical, a jury member should never have 100% confidence that a defendant is guilty. And that's not the standard. The reason for this is because only a witness who has firsthand knowledge should ever have 100% confidence. If we circle back to the Cheerio example, the only way you're gonna have 100% confidence beyond all doubts is if you open up that Cheerio box and you look inside, but again, That's not the standard. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. So what ends up happening in a criminal trial, if we are to use the analogous Cheerio example, is you can't look inside, but let's say you may have doubts and you can't determine whether or not these doubts are reasonable or unreasonable when it comes to whether or not there's Cheerios in this box. So you, just out of fear of getting in trouble, of opening up a box like a crazy person in the middle of a grocery store, you turn to an employee. And let's say I'm that employee. And so you say, sir, can you go ahead and look and see if there's Cheerios in this box? I have some concerns. So I open it up, I look inside, and let's say I take a picture, or I guess in today's day and age is with a phone, I take a picture, or it's actually with a selfie style. I take a picture of the Cheerios with me in it for the gram, and then I show it to you, and then you look at the picture and it's like, okay, there's Cheerios in there. But keep in mind, Just because it's a picture doesn't mean you should get to 100% confidence. Because what if I actually had some type of Photoshop ability on my thumb and I somehow changed it uh, to where it went from scrap metal to Cheerios in a blink of an eye. If I had those skills, that'd be extremely impressive. But at the same time, that's a possibility. And it's possible there's still scrap metal in there. It's possible I'm a magician and I was able to shake it just right to where the Cheerios turned into scrap metal. It's all possible. The question is, is it reasonable to assume that's what happened? The answer in that scenario is no. It's not reasonable to have doubt in that situation. Because there's no reasonable doubt, 
that means you need to go and purchase that Cheerio box if you really want Cheerios at that point. Now, the flip is the flip side is also true. If I'm a shady individual, I said, hey, one second, let me mess with this picture real quick. I want to make sure I look good in it. In reality, it looks just like a terrible Photoshop job to where when I show you the picture, it's like, yeah, that was clearly sc scrap metal at that point in time. If you have doubts at that stage, that may actually be reasonable. If you look at all the facts, the circumstances, the boxes just says Wheaties on it or it's made of wood and it doesn't really look like a Cheerios box and I look like a shady individual and I'm messing with my phone to show you a poorly cropped and edited photo, then at that point in time, it's probably reasonable to have doubts and to not purchase the Cheerio box. So that gets us to a criminal trial. Beyond a reasonable doubt, if at the end of the trial, if the doubts you have are reasonable, then you can't convict. But if the doubts you have are possibilities, but those possibilities are so outlandish, unreasonable, then you need, you're required to convict under the law because you've satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt. Or not you, but the prosecutor. You know what I mean. But that essentially sums up and defines the concept of beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, I'm gonna wave my arms awkwardly because I do want you to keep in mind that this lesson is focused on these foundational examples that we're gonna build upon in the following lesson. Because what I don't want you to do is stop this lesson and then explain these concepts using the examples I just did in this video. If you do that, you're going to fail as an advocate. If you remember, this entire module is focused on jury selection. And jury selection is all about getting valuable information from the jurors or potential jurors to determine who's going to be a good fit Maybe more importantly, who's not gonna be a good fit when it comes to selecting who goes in that jury box. So if you just go through your jury selection by explaining these concepts and these burdens of proof, and you're not actually doing your job, you're not actually getting that valuable information to figure out who's a good fit and who's not a good fit. So now that we have these foundational examples, this next lesson is gonna talk exactly how you can incorporate these concepts, these examples, and along the way, you can ask important questions, you can get a feel for each potential jury member and where they sit on the spectrum of either favorable or unfavorable. And then you can also develop some sort of bond with the ones who are maybe leaning a little bit on your side. Okay, if you have any questions, leave those below. If you don't, I'll see you in the next lesson.